Ruiz. Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. Brought to you by FunkinStuff.net, this is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, Truth Seekers, and Truth Crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funkin' Stuff merchandise, and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm honored to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership, a true funk rock icon, mother's finest singer-songwriter, Joyce Baby Jean Kennedy. Along with her husband, Glenn Doc Murdoch, she is a founding member of a band that has blazed musical trails and obliterated genre and racial boundaries throughout its 50-plus year history with amazing classic tracks like Baby Love, Truth Will Set You Free, Giving You All the Love Inside of Me, Rain, Fire, Mickey's Monkey, Can't Fight the Feeling, Love Changes, and Don't Want to Come Back. Mother's Finest notched three straight gold albums during the 1970s while becoming a world-renowned live act. During a 1980s break from the group, Kennedy scored a hit ballad duet with Jeffrey Osborne called The First Time I Made Love. This year, she released the six-song EP, Rocket My Soul, and Mother's Finest continues to throw it down on stage. Joyce, again, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? Wow, that was a lot. Have I done all that? <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty cool, Scott. That yeah. was pretty cool. Yeah, I'm doing fine. I'm doing great in these days. Each day is a, is a wonderment. I, I'm appreciative to be able to still do what I love to do every day and contemplate on to continue to do it. You know, um, everybody's good. You know, we're still doing great. We were nine, nine weeks in Europe this year, and uh, that was wonderful. And uh, we came back as strong as it was before the top of COVID. That, that shut everything down. So we're regrouping and getting our strength back, and everything looks really wonderful. The EP that I did, which is on Spotify, Rocking My Soul, is uh, it's pretty awesome to me because uh, it kind of embellishes that whole rock funk thing. Because as, as the years came about, we got a little bit um, to the uh, heavy side. Which is great because now we carry two guitars where we used to only have the guitar. And Mo is still with us. John Hayes is with us. We have a new bass player, Juan Van Donk. Uh, Dion Derrick is still on drums. Um, I have two uh, backup singers now. And the sound is still positive and still very strong. So when you listen to Rockin' My Soul, you will hear how the sound has grown and changed a little bit. So we're doing great. 
Yeah, and I can vouch for that firsthand because I caught you guys playing in Kannapolis over the summer, and uh, I enjoyed it immensely back in July, and I'm wearing a shirt I got there. Uh, you can't see it, but I am wearing it right now, so there you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. That always looks good. Which shirt you got? You got an MF Shield or a or yeah. JK shirt? The yeah, uh, MF Shield. We should have got yeah, I should have got the JK one too. That was pretty awesome too. Oh, it was. I love the artwork on that one too. Yeah. Yeah, but you didn't mention, Scott, you didn't mention the Georgia Music Hall of Fame and you didn't mention the uh, Smithsonian Museum of uh, Black History as far as music. We're also inducted there as well. Well deserved, that's for sure. Um, well, thank you. Joyce, I, I want to ask you, uh, you know, back in your early years, the band's been around over 50 years now. It's hard to uh, believe, I'm sure. But um, okay. can you remember back then, you know, what was sort of the inspiration and vision uh, when you first got started with Mother's Finest? Well, we always wanted to be a band that everybody could fall in love with or have a good time with us. Um, we had so many uh, energies to pull from. Uh, there was Woodstock. We loved the whole show. We used to go and see that almost every night after the gig and um, chose the energies of different bands and different genres that we, would, that we wanted to incorporate in, in our band because when we first got together, there wasn't a sound. You know, the sound came as we grew and we were playing things like the Stylistics and the Delphonics and we were playing the Stones and we were playing the Commodores. We were, we were diving into all genres of music. So from that, I think we gathered and during those times, you know, Motown uh, kind of was the powerhouse of artists and they had the whole staging of routines and, other, and the great pacings of shows. So we pulled from that. So eventually our live show got to be our renaissance. You know, that was the thing that people loved about us because the energy levels were so powerful. But we were also very young, too. But so we drew from those things. We drew from the Stones and we drew from the, uh, you know, the Aerosmiths and we drew from the Commodores and the Stylics, all the things that made we thought were great about them, we tried to, to use. So our three-part harmonies between Glenn, Wizard, and myself were also significant with our sound, which came about naturally because we were all from um, uh, doo-wop and church and jazz backgrounds. So harmonies were easy for us. And uh, it, that's why, you know, Fire and uh, Come Fly With Me, the Baby Love Harmonies, they have that bass, that, that bass in gospel soul. But yet, you know, you have the, the, the push of the funk, you know, because our whole funk thing comes from the bass and drums. Well, usually bands who, who say uh, they have a rock sound is usually guitar and drums. But ours was really the funk was layered with the drums and the bass. And then the guitars were on top. So that made our funk rock sound with the three-part harmony gospel vocals that lay sometimes in jazz kind of make personify Mother's Finest as a whole. And through the years, we got a little bit heavier because music got heavier. And so, you know, we moved along certain lines that where we could keep our sound and also not be a uh, old school band. That's what we didn't want. And we didn't want our sound to stay in the 70s that from where we started. So as the 70s moved into the 80s, we moved a little bit. As the 80s came about, we moved a little bit keeping the sound uh, that we originally had, which was those six people on stage. So our influences were all over the place, you know, and when we started to write, it was mostly uh, what we felt at the time. You know, there was never a blueprint for Mother Sinus. The sound evolved as we evolved. Yeah, um, thank you for that. And Joyce, do you recall like one or two things that happened early on that maybe um, you struggled with and made you uh, stronger, you know, that you learned from in the early years moving forward? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it got our reputation got so, so powerful till they thought that they would book us just about with anybody. So there was a date that was uh, uh, booked for us with Ted Nugent. And then there was another one. I can't think of the guy's name now. But it was a very odd to the side of where we were, especially with the funk. And um, 
when they, you know, the thing was, the fight was that we were an, uh, a multiracial band, so predominantly people of color, but we were in the rock scene. So that was disconcerting for a lot of people, especially radio in those days. So the record company said, well, you know what? The problem is, it's not the music, is that people consider people of color not playing rock and roll, that it doesn't fit. So they said, well, let's don't put pictures, let's don't put their pictures on the album covers anymore to see what would happen. Now, that made us stronger because we were playing Chicago, we were playing with, I think we were on tour with Aerosmith, and the radio stations had, didn't know us very well. They only knew the music. So they were playing like crazy at Mother's Finest. And then they found out that band was predominantly black and they stopped playing the record. Mm. So that made us very strong and very belligerent to some degree. So a lot of times, even though as strong as your, uh, and then what was, hey, Dion, do you remember that, uh, the Spectrum in Philly when the guys, uh, what was that band that we were playing with that night? Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath, yeah. Then there was a date we played with Black Sabbath. They didn't know who we were. They knew the music, but they didn't know the band was uh, predominantly black, right? So they were just cra- going crazy about it, crazy. Mother Sinus and Black Sabbath. And boy, those lights came on, and they saw there was a bunch of black folks up there. It was not happy. It wasn't a happy moment. So those are the two things that stood out that made us uh, stronger. You know, Joyce, I'm thinking about, um, you know, I've always been a uh, Prince fan also, and I saw his show at the uh, Coliseum in Los Angeles in 1981, opening for the Rolling Stones when he got booed off the stage and they threw batteries at him and stuff like that. Yeah. So, uh, and and I always felt it was, you know, racially motivated uh, being there. And I'm wondering, um, do you think it's changed over over the years or is it still? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, a couple of things. You know, the party like a rock star showed up. Then you had artists like uh, Outkast. Then you had uh, Living Color come around. You know, there's been a couple of groups that, for timing's sake, kind of moved everybody's minds and hearts a little bit further to where they don't really want to pocket you so easily. You know, yeah. How, how do you feel about being such an influence on, you know, groups like Living Color and 24-7 Spies and... Um, just there's a whole uh, long line of of groups that are multiracial or black and have rock in right. what they do. Right. How do I feel? Great. I mean, I think it's lovely. Somebody has to do it. <laughs> you know, heavy is the is the one who wears the crown. It's all good. I think it's beautiful, and it's not over yet. You know, there's still work to be done in that genre to where you know, trying to, uh, you know, even country, look at country is, is influenced by hip hop now, you know, country is not even as country as it used to be, what, 10, 20 years ago, uh, country is taking over the whole rock genre, you know, and the rhythm and blues market is pretty much gone. So there's a lot of changes that are taking place in our industry. Uh, and, and the website, internet, you know, helps, but then it doesn't help at the same time. You know, so we've still got some walls to break down. How'd you feel back in the day, uh, say in the early seventies, you know, when there were other kind of trailblazing, um, you know, black female singers like Betty Davis or Shaka Khan or Max Ann, did you feel like they were, you know, trying to sort of emulate what you did or did you know them? No, nah, no, I think we were all, see, that was the good thing about that time. We all had our shoes. We had our own shoes to wear. We weren't trying to wear other people's shoes. You know, Betty Davis was in her spirit. Chaka was in her spirit. I was in my spirit. And that's really all. And people allowed you to do that. You know, now it's like every singer is starting to, you know, be the same as the last five. Were you on some bills early on with Funkadelic? Yeah, Funkadelic. Yes, absolutely. I remember that one. We've had a couple. We we got to be great friends because George was kind of George Clinton was the kind of guy that understood how this this game is played in this industry. Is you know the bureaucracy of it all. Um, they did well because they stayed in a certain genre. Our thing was that we you know we danced between genres so a lot of times people didn't know what face that we had what face mother science really had 
They had a female singer. They had a male singer. They played funk. They played rock. You know, they had a couple of guitars. I mean, it was a crazy thing, but yet still, that was what made us special at the same time. Were they ready to embrace that? I don't know. But the dates we played with, with P-Funk and them were always so wonderful because, we, you know, it was like family. There was no uh, dissension. You know, they embraced, we, we embraced them, they embraced us, and the people had a great time. And that's all that's important. I know, uh, Joyce, you kind of had a little bit of a false start or a little bit of an issue with RCA with the first deal, and then you ended up going to Epic Records and having success. Um, right. Was there one or two sort of turning points that led to, you know, getting that Epic Records deal for you guys? No, it was an easy peasy. It was an easy move. It was timely. And I think in the midst of that, I think we changed managers. And in, in those days, that's usually what happened. I don't recall it specifically, but I knew it wasn't a difficult move. What was the process like of the band in terms of its creativity and, and its process? You know, how did you come up with tracks and did you do a lot of rehearsing and was there a lot of camaraderie and that kind of thing? Yeah, in those days we actually lived together. So rehearsal time was all the time. And if there was an idea floating around, we made sure we got together and it was developed, you know, and everybody was involved because that everybody's involvement was the sound. And so that was that was easy. That was those days. You know, we lived together all the day played. We played our gig. We came home. If there was something that happened on stage that we said, you know, that was a good groove. Let's try to develop that. So that went on and on for years. Did you have any preference to being on a rock or a funk bill, you know, in terms of your, your shows? Nope. We played everywhere. We played with everybody. I mean, in 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 a day, uh, we could play the Commodores and and, and then play the ACDC the same day. Never changed the show. The show was exactly the same. Are there one or two shows that just stand out in your mind for just being particularly memorable? Whether it's uh, yeah, you know, because just totally hell a- just totally hellified. <laughs> yeah. 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 The show we did was we did a run about a three day run with ACDC. It was truly hellified. It was great. What year about was that? Do you think? Oh, stop now! I don't remember. <laughs> it was probably the eighties, right? I don't know. Dion said it was the eighties. I don't remember. I don't know. It was late. That was in seventy nine. Yeah, late seventies or early eighties. Okay, Highway to hell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, so if it was 79, it would have been when they still had Bon Scott uh, before. Yes, Brian. the original band. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes, the original band. Am I lucky or what? I got to see the real band. Yeah. Wow. What country Not, was that? Where was that uh, tour? We were somewhere in the North Car- in the Carolina. It was in the really? South. Really? You know, yeah. I'm in North Carolina right now. Is that where you are? Yeah. yeah. We're going to be there. We're going to be playing there in February, I think. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, yeah. We usually play. We usually play the Lincoln Theater down there in Raleigh. Oh, you got to come to Charlotte. That's where I am. Oh, you're in Charlotte. I don't know where. Well, yeah, we'll probably be in Charlotte sometime this year. The dates have yet to come in. It's too. You know, we're at the end of the year right now, so um, we usually start getting dates coming in around the first of the year. Anything besides ACDC that just uh, pops in your head? Maybe it was a. Uh, uh, just a gigantic crowd or, or maybe something that was, funny happened or. Well, no, I mean, shoot, man, I, are you kidding me? There was so many of those. I can't recall most of them, but the one ACDC stands out in my heart today and the Aerosmith tour, they played, we played the Omni in Atlanta. That was awesome. Huge crowd sell out. Um, then there was one with Bootsy in D.C. That was the Capitol Theater. That was a sellout. That was a long uh, Love Changes was number one then. Uh, and Rock Palace in Germany. Oh, my God, that has gone down in history. That one is still pretty popular. It still runs every year, too, as well. You you must be yeah, looking no. over my you must be looking over my shoulder because I had that just next on my list here, that Rock Palace show, because. It's just such absolute fire. You know, it's so great that that was captured on film because there's so many great acts from the 70s, especially black acts, 
where there's not yeah. enough, you know, footage preserving their performing. But for you guys, that was just amazing. Yeah, thank you. That's Europe for you, where we still go. Still pretty powerful there. And I mean, your uh, vocals, I mean, you were just fire in that show, Joyce. I mean, just, you know, that show is, I think, seeing that just cemented you as being one of my all-time favorite female singers, for sure. Oh, yeah. oh the pressure. Too much pressure. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, how... How hard was it, though? You guys, you said you kind of developed thick skin uh, because of the, some of the issues you ran into. But how are, how hard was it to contend with narrow minds at record labels, at radio, the public? You know, I mean, you've talked about it in some of your songs through the years too. Yeah. Well, life is expensive and life is difficult. It's all about our perspective and our attitudes toward things. Our attitude was we're always going to be the best that we can be. When we're on, our, when we're on anybody's stage, the, while we're there, the stage belongs to us. And we give them the best that we can give them. Now, out of, you know, they, the ratio is if you've got 1,000 people, if you walk away with 800 of those, you can do, you've done your job. You're not going to get 100%, not always. But if you can steal 800 out of that 1,000, then you're doing great. If we can walk off of that stage and we feel like we've done the best that we could, that's all that anybody can do. And that was our attitude about everything. We couldn't let it stop us. And we couldn't, you know, of course, we lay down at night and individually we'll go over what we did and say, well, maybe I could have done that better. Or maybe I'll move that song or maybe we'll redo the opener constantly because we, we wanted to be great at who, at who we were. And uh, that was a constant fit. And spiritually, you know, we understood that every day is not going to be the same. Every gig is not going to be the same. You know, people are going to love you. Some people ain't going to love you. But that doesn't mean that you can't get up there and, and give it your best. And that was pretty much the run of our attitude as a band. It's funny because, you know, I kind of looked, have looked at funk as being like, you know, black hard rock, basically, you know, and, and it just seems so natural to me to bring together, you know, hard rock and funk and just, you know, for minds closed off to that, I just don't understand it really. Well, it's really about the business and how it's set up. They don't want you to have too many faces because that means they have to work too hard. Um, if you're in funk, you're going to draw a certain uh, type of uh, audience. If you're in metal, you draw a certain type of metal. If you're just truly sold, then, then there's that. And when you try to crossbreed those things, you are asking for a little bit more work. And it may or may not happen. But if you can lay ground in that, in that area, just like you said with the other bands that came after us, then the work that you were meant to do has been done. And you can't ask for much more than that. I mean, the, sp the small print doesn't say you're going to be uh, a multimillionaire a millionaire in this business. The best you can do is make a name for yourself. And I think Mother's Finest did that to where we have gained respect throughout the industry uh, for what we've done and what we've had to bear. Well, in that vein, Joyce, do you feel like Mother's Finest gets enough notoriety? They get enough. They could call on us a little bit more often, but there again, you're, you're a little obsolete, you know. Kinda, you kind of shadow the water a little bit. And that's okay, but you're talking about a band that's been around for 50-some years, you know what I mean? Yeah, did you ever imagine that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. I thought I, I thought I would have been retired by then. In fact, at the top of COVID, I thought, well, this would be a good time to retire. Mm, no. <laughs> no. It's the, I mean, you know, we just have too much fun. I mean, we just really have too much fun. And, you know, the audiences are still there. I mean, why not? You know what I mean? For sure. You know, I had, I don't know if he remembers, but I had Glenn on the show a few years ago. So I have kind of a sense of, of him in terms of his personality and temperament. But can you tell um, listeners a little bit about Mo and Wizard, what, what they're like as just guys? Oh, Mo, Mo is the funk guy. You'd be surprised how funky Mo is. Mo is a lover of Ohio players, of the Commodores, of 
uh, he plays all those guys from that era. That's his slick. That's why that rhythm guitar on Baby Love is so funky, because that's his thing. But you just see him because he's a white guy. You would think he would be the whole the holy grail of the rock in the band, but that's not true. And Wizard is a guy that is so flavorful as a bass player. He just knows what to play, when to play. He was the really predominant writer in the band. And uh, that was my right hand. Doc was my left hand. Him and Mo was my left side. You know what I mean? I'm in the middle. And that's how we work the stage always. You know, those guys, I mean, Wiz is still, uh, he doesn't really know how great he is, you know. And maybe that's, that's good for us that he doesn't know. And Mo, I mean, he was just, he was just great. You know, the, the sound that he and Wizard made, they would spend hours in the, in the studio, just the two of them, creating certain riffs and stuff. And they had some of the best riffs, which also added to the sound. I mean, they played like one. It was so awesome. You know, um, Mo is the kind of guy, he's a Virgo. And he's hard to move when he makes up his mind about something. But usually if we would allow him to have that room, which we allowed each person to be as creative as they could be, he came up with stuff that was awesome. The guitar solo in Thank You for the Love is beautiful. The guitar solo in and Love Changes is awesome. Um, Wiz is just, he, like I said, he just knows what to play, when to play, and his vocals, the three of us just kind of yell like we were born to do it, you know? Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. I think... Yeah. You know, Mother's Finest maybe could do with more notoriety, but, um, you know, certainly it's out there and, and, and the group has notoriety to an extent. But I think um, some of the players like Mo and, and Wizard, you know, maybe should get more recognition because I think they're incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think so, too. But they never really put themselves out like that either. You know, the interviews they did, they never asked, they never crammed for those. You know, they didn't really go after the the uh, notoriety of a guitar player in Mother's Finance or a bass player. They We were all fine just being together and doing what we could do because we knew we couldn't find it anyplace else. This was the best place for us. And I remember when B.B. first left the band, I remember I was in L.A. and he called me up on the phone in the rain. And I think I forget who that was that band, Marshall Tucker, he left and went with. He went with Marshall Tucker. For whatever reasons it were, I never knew why. But he says, I really want to come back. He said, because I can't find what we had. And this had been already six, seven months down the road that he had been gone. I had moved to L.A. and started something else. And at that time, Dion had grown into this great drummer. And and by that time, Dion was already incorporated into the band. And I said, well, B, I said, I don't know, dude. I said, the timing could, couldn't be worse. I said, we got Dion in the band now. And Dion grew up on the best two drummers that we had. The fellow named Peppy Daniels and B.B. were the best drummers that we ever had. And he grew up listening to those guys. And you can't find, I mean, going through 13 drummers is so 14 or 15 at this moment. You can't find these, you couldn't find another drummer to fit those shoes. And Lord knows we did try. But Dion was the only one that ever fit in those shoes. And so I said, well, I don't know at this point. It could be a worse time, B.B. I uh, said, so we're getting ready to go to, on, on tour, and Dion's already worked in. I don't know what to tell you. Is, is Dion your only child? Yes. I didn't have time for no more, man. <laughs> well, can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about what, what was it like having, you know, a rock and roll relationship and, and marriage and partnership and you know, what was that dynamic the, like through the years? The best until he grew up. You know, when he was young, it was fun. I mean, he had the best time uh, because we took him everywhere with us, you know. We had this huge, uh, incredible German shepherd that used to be his, his security, his bodyguard. And we took him everywhere with us. He's, he's seen everybody on stage. Uh, if you look on the live record, he's right there in the corner standing watching us on stage. When he was a, a young guy, or I guess he was around 14. Or that. Um, yeah, it was great. You know, and then, you know, when you got men, they, they grow up and they get their own opinions. They get married and they have their own children. It gets a little bit less fun. But it's creatively, it's always powerful, you know. And uh, he's still a great drummer and he keeps that sound going, man. He, he doesn't get tired. And I love that. Most of the other drummers, we wore them out over time. They couldn't make it. <laughs> 
<laughs> what about you and Glenn? What's the secret to uh, that union? You think over all these years? Well, I wish. Oh, oh, Jesus, man! I wish I could tell. I wish I had an answer for that. Neither one of us have an answer for that because, please, our time together has been more than uh, two lifetimes, really. Because uh, we raised a family, we've been together as a as a couple, and we also work together. So we we always what we did eventually is find the space within the space within the marriage to where we could still be okay with one, one another. So we usually in the house we have our different spaces and within the house to where we can do whatever it is that we want to do that makes us happy, so we can decompress. But other than that, we never had a problem with that. As he got older, it got easier, that's to be, to be honest, you know. It was difficult when he was a younger man because there was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, deliciousness out there, hmm. you know, which in time, you know, men get over that. But as far as the dissension within the band and within the relationship, there was hardly ever any. We had a great time. Have had, still having. Well, you definitely have beaten the odds with that, you know, if you look at others out there. So congratulations on that, too. Thank you. Joyce, I'm, just, what... I'm a good girl. I'm just a good girl. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, which one or two albums are you most proud of in the catalog and why? Oh, I love Mother Factor and I love Another Mother Further. Those are my two favorites. What is it you like so much about those ones? Oh, I was just singing my little booty off on Mother Factor. And I love the relationship of the sound and everybody's involvement in Another Mother Further. That was a record that we had seasoned for about maybe six or seven months before we actually recorded it. And then the live record, I have to put three in there. Then the live record was the apex of those two records put together. And I think those stand out for me by far. And what about three or four songs? Uh, my favorite songs, I think, oh, geez, that's a good one. I see the ones we still do in the show are Baby Love. We still do Baby Love. We still do Piece of the Rock. And we still do, uh, we used to do Hot Rug Love. We don't do Hot Rug Love anymore. We do uh, Can't Fight the Feeling. And we do those three. Uh, we usually can't leave the show without doing those. And then on Mother Factor, of course, is the Love Changes. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, Fight the Feeling is, is Fight the Feeling on Love Changes. I think that one's on there. But Peace of the Rock, Baby Love, the uh, Elvis Presley cover that we did, Burning Love, that, those were all fun. Disco is still a favorite. Uh, and, uh, yeah, those are three or four songs. Well, I got to tell you, you know, I do a radio show um, on the greatest funk tracks of all time. And uh, the one I picked uh, for Mother's Finest for me first was Truth Will Set You Free. Ah, uh, you like truth. Yeah. Yeah, truth is, is a sneaker. It's kind of a quiet monster. Uh, they've used it in some TV shows. They've used Piece of Rock in some TV shows. Um would they just use fire on an HBO special just recently here, which I thought was very impressive. And, you know, all is good. And uh, Baby Love has been uh, recorded more than once, you know, and I, same thing with Love Changes. In fact, uh, Jamie Lee Fox and Mary J. Blige actually covered Love Changes. That was impressive. So, yeah, you know, we've been lucky. We've done some great work, you know, um, we had a good time doing it, too. Now, I heard there was a bit of a controversy over working with Skip Scarborough back in uh, the late 70s. You, know, you kind of actually wrote more of that song than people know? Yeah. There's no controversy. That's the truth. He produced that entire Not album or just that song? No, he did the whole album. Yeah, mm -hmm. CBS kind of got him to do the whole record because they wanted us to have more of a um, black radio base. They figured that was the, that would be the way to break the band completely. But in doing so, we lost our audience. We lost our white audience. 
while with Mother Factor. Um, they were scrambling just trying to figure out how to break this band because they saw that there was brilliance there, but they didn't know what to do, you know. Um, so uh, Skip was brought in to try to give us a black bass. And that's where we wrote Love Changes. And uh, we had all the other songs already written by the band. And he came in and um, he talked to me and Doc about our relationship. He was he really actually wrote it around our relationship. And uh, when we came into the studio, uh, Wizard started playing the bass line. And then I started singing the chorus of Love Changes. And then we were called over to Europe to do Rock Palace. And while we were gone, uh, he finished uh, the song. And then when I came back, I did the vocal track on it. But the actual hook and idea came from Mother Sinus. Mm -hmm. And that's the story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's why, you know, the show's called Truth and Rhythm that you're talking on, so we definitely want to set the record straight as much as we can. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's the stuff like that happens in this business, dude. There's not much you can say or do about that. You just go on. You know, and then later on, we found out actually, uh, oh, I forget what that was, coming out of D.C. Uh, you're talk oh, yeah, somebody was talking about how who wrote what song. And the way we ran our business was because we're all in the room together and we all had a little bit of creativity within the song, even though if somebody wrote the song, then once we sat in the room and we worked on the song and we brought it to fruition as far as what everybody thought, then our publishing company said it was by Mother's Finest, written by or by Mother's Finest. So that uh, business-wise, we thought that somebody wouldn't be in a Rolls Royce and then somebody else would be in a Chevrolet because we're all making this work. So when we saw uh, a, a writership, a publishing writership for Skip Scar Scarborough, we also saw that his name was on I Don't Want to Come Back. And I Don't Want to Come Back was written by Michael Keck, the keyboard player, Wizard, and myself. But that's how people do. They'll just put their name on stuff, and you know, they, people don't know any different. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it seems like, yeah. I, especially in, um, I don't know if it's in all music that way, but I just, you know, I mostly interview funk R&B and uh, soul artists and, and it seems rampant in those genres, especially to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's just some stuff. Yeah. But we've gotten over it a lot over time. You know, it's getting better. People are getting, taking care of their own business, you know, being at the head of it. And uh, I think it's timely. You know, we've gotten smarter over the years because of those things. You know. You uh, certainly flipped back the other way when you came back after that with Iron Age. That well, that one really rocks. <laughs> Iron Age, we were just kind of shoving it up there <laughs> with Iron Age. We had a great time doing that one, dude. Yeah, Iron Age was something else. <laughs> and there you go. Were you guys, you guys were kind of intentionally saying we want to put the pedal to the metal more on that one? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How, how much did no. the band, how much did you and the band keep your attention or eyes on competition out there in terms of other bands, what they were doing and, and things like that? Not much because we were in our own space. We had our own shoes to wear. We didn't have to worry about everybody else. And that's what Dion tells me right now. He says, Mom, you don't have to compete with the other young female singers out here because you've already created your base already. Don't worry about the young girls that's coming up behind you because all you have to do is play to the people that know who you are and love what you do. And that was a lot of wisdom in that because, you know, you constantly, as a woman, you constantly want to be accepted. You, are, you constantly want to look good. You are constantly want to look as good as the next guy, the next girl that comes out. And at some point, that's got to go away in your mind and your heart. You just have to be yourself. Was there another band that you saw perform that just blew your socks off? You thought they were just really something on stage? Oh, what well, careful, Dee. Um, mm, I think, wow, that's hard. Because they were all in those days, everybody was so good. 
you know, in their own right. P-Funk was great. Aerosmith was great. ACDC was awesome. Uh, I didn't see not one band that threw me back, uh, that made me reconsider what I do. No, nobody. I, I, I can't remember not one band that made me think second about, you know, us, because we were always in our own, our own thing. We had our own shoes to wear, you know. How much did you focus on, you know, um, image in terms of, you know, outfits and maybe, you know, stage moves and things like that? Oh, lots. We always wanted to be sharp. We had our own personal designer uh, out of Florida. And, uh, you know, the thing about MF, that we, it was such a natural thing for the, the, for the band as a unit. To a lot of the things we did, we made looked hard, but it was easy to us. You know, our moves were not rehearsed like day after day after day for eight, nine hours. Once we did something, we could go right back to that once we got on stage. We knew exactly where, where, where the move came. And because when we were on stage, that's where we were. We weren't somewhere else. Was, all the focus was on stage. And the concept was, Everybody's not going to be on point every night, but you got five other people to hold you up. So if you're a little bit on the one on the left side one night, don't worry about it because everybody else has got you. The stage is still going to move, and that's the main thing. We counted on each other for whatever we brought to the stage. We counted on that, and usually everybody would show up. But if one night somebody's like I said, a little bit off to the left. There were five other people to hold that image up. So our shows never deviated from the uh, uh, level of energy or the level of effort. And we wanted people to feel and know that we work on our music, that we work on our band, that we didn't just show up just to, you know, just to party. That's not, that wasn't what we were all about. Of course, it's fun when you, you leave them not uh, wanting a little bit more. You know, you come back for two or three encores. That is the whole day for us. That was the whole day for us. We, that made our day that year. And how often then we could do that, we felt that, you know, God's purpose was fulfilled as far as a man is concerned. Because that's really all we can do. We're not in control of none of this stuff in this world by far, you know. Uh, we don't know what we don't know, you know. We didn't know how far we were going to go. We were just doing it, doing it the best we can. We were, our reputation. There was no negative um, conversation about Mother's Finals, whether they were on time, whether they charged too much, whether they were on drugs or none of that craziness. We kept it in a respectful way, even when we travel outside of the country. We always want to be the best Americans that we could be. We always want to be at our best behavior to show who we were, you know, because we were a multiracial band. So there was a lot of responsibility even in that. And we found that out as the years went by, you know, and even splitting up for six years kind of was, kind of hurt us a little bit because that six years, that's when uh, Living Color came about. You know, everything changed during that time. And Wizard had went with uh, Stevie Nicks, and I came out to L.A., and I did the, uh, the Grammy song with uh, Jeffrey Osborne. You know, we did different things. But, you know, energy and, and chemistry – so important in this in this business, especially when you rely on other people's spirit. And we just had that chemistry. And outside of that, we were all qu quite talented and creative. But together, we were a power. We didn't realize that, I think, as much as we did when we split up. And uh, it was a moment of tears when we actually got back together after six or seven years in the same room. We, that was that was what we were made of, and it was a beautiful thing, you know. Um, I want to make sure that I say that because I don't go there a lot. But the truth of the matter is we found out that we were all much better together than we were apart. And I think, you know, you made some great records later on, too, like Black Radio Won't Play This Record and uh, mm -hmm. Better Funk and Physical and... Uh, you mm -hmm. know, there's, there's some great tunes and moments on, and goody two shoes and, you know, there's good stuff on those yeah. records. Thank you. Yeah. It's still a job. It's still a job to try to make those things work, you know, especially getting into the digital world. 
you know, the online stuff is still pretty hard, you know, but I feel the same way you do about those records. Uh, Goody Two Shoes and Metafunk and Physical. I mean, there's some, some good work on those songs, on those records. And I, I think they're, they're still going to have their day, to be honest. You know, sometimes you don't have to keep searching out for a better song or a better day or a better studio. Sometimes it's just sitting right there in, in your face. Yeah, well, hopefully some people checking out this show will uh, go check out those records, too, if they haven't already. Um, yeah, thank you. And When you did the uh, solo thing in the 80s, Joyce, um, was that something you kind of wanted to get out of your system, or what directed you that way? No, the, well, the band had split up, you know. Uh, Wizard had gone with uh, Stevie Nicks, and B.B. had gone with uh, Marshall Tucker. It was a, It was a crazy space, so... That was my alternative. What do you do now, Joyce? Well, you go to L.A. and you try to get a record deal on your own. That's how that happened. That was not a desire of my own, no. I would have never done that if I had the position hadn't, uh, you know, showed itself. Were, were, you, were you surprised, though, that you got such a big hit with it? Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I wasn't surprised. I mean, I am a singer, and it's all about the singer and the song, you know. And the position with George Duke and Jeffrey Osborne was a dream. You know, even though it wasn't the genre that I felt the most safe and the most protected and the most purposeful, it was still something I knew how to do because I started out doing that kind of music. I started out in R&B. I started out in jazz. Eventually, I evolved to the rock funk thing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think so I wasn't it, surprised. I mean, they were real happy that I wanted to do that because everybody was pushing me to do that, but I didn't want to do that. You know, I didn't want that to be my thing. I, I remember at the time thinking at first, wait, is that the same Joyce Kennedy? She sounds good, but wow, she's got range, you know? <laughs> it was confusing. It was confusing to a lot of people. They didn't know I was the same girl out of Mother's Finest. Again, a confusing thing. I got to say that Jeffrey Osborne is one of my favorite, uh, you know, R&B soul singers. Yeah, why not? He's got a beautiful voice. Are you kidding? Yeah. My God, we got to be good friends. Still are. In fact, the first date we played after COVID, when we finally could come to and play a gig, was with Jeffrey. He surprised the hell out of me. He snuck up behind me. I hadn't seen him in about 30 years. I guess that had been a little over 30 years. Yeah, it's great. He's still out there doing it, and um, from all accounts, seems like a great guy. Oh, yeah, definitely. Take my word for it. He's a great person. What, what's your process for, you know, pampering and looking after your vocal instrument? Uh, <laughs> I'm praying every night. Are you kidding? This voice has been at it for a long time, but I have uh, just reoriented certain melodies in the songs. And also, I do use some tracks now in the show um, so that I don't wear myself out. If I've got five weeks of touring, there's no way my voice is going to hold up at the level that I wish it to be uh, after all those shows. So we've incorporated some tracks, especially all the songs that people come to hear. And I've just danced around some notes. Some of those notes are not as high as they used to be. So uh, I'm constantly doing that. But other than that, I just try to stay open. And I have little pinchers and sprays and stuff that I use on stage. And the top of the line is get my rest. So, you know, I'm all about the work when I'm on the road. It's not about hanging out. I do as few interviews as I can. So I'm not talking. And uh, that's pretty much it. What about back, you know, in the younger years, you know, did you ever no sort of, yeah, you didn't ever nope. sing your voice out or? Nope. <laughs> nope. And we were doing five and six nights in, in a row uh, with maybe a day off in those days. No, the voice didn't tire in those days. It was a young voice. <laughs> wow. Um, looking at funk in general, Joyce, uh, what is that? form of music mean to you and and why do you think it, it it lives on even though at times it's sort of been a little bit uh kicked to the the curb if you ask me i don't think it's gotten as much you know 
notice as a lot of other, other genres and it should. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, funk like blues is cultural and it has to do with your life. Uh, the grooves are about what you experienced in your life, whether you've had, you know, hard times, just like the blues. And it's really off the cuff. It's not uh, pretentious, you know. Uh, the grooves come off the top of your head and you work around it. And um, I think a lot of the music now is a little bit pretentious and a little bit perceived or contrived. So you don't get that funk no more, you know. People that are still hanging out there, like the Isley Brothers, they still bring in that funk, you know. And some, you know, like Prince, they're gone now. You know, they're not even here. So that just kind of leaves it hanging, you know what I mean, as far as funk is concerned. Uh, as also with blues. Blues is still pretty much almost alternative now. And uh, But like I said, it's rooted in culture, and you don't have a lot of that now because of the Internet, and everybody wants to have a hit record like yesterday, and nothing is uh, developed over time. And they don't allow you to have uh, to develop over time. I mean, these bands get put together, or these singers get together as soon as they can sing two or three notes. They want a record deal, and they get the record deal, and then, you know, what you got? Not too much. You know, it takes time to develop an artist, to be able to embrace an audience and let them feel what it is you're trying to say with your music. And a lot of this is just a little bit too contrived for me. What about uh, Rock in My Soul? You know, what inspired you to, to get that together and put it out this year? Well, MF needed something. You know, we hadn't done a record in a long time. And uh, those those pieces of material I had for four minutes or so. And so I thought that it would just be juice to let people know we were still out here making music. Is there going to be more new music in the future, do you think? Or what's Oh, happening? yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's going to be more music. But like I said, this was just some juice. And, uh, you know, we're working on stuff all the time. You know? But the problem is some of the issues that we have now is just trying to bridge the gap. John lives still in Europe, and the bass player lives in California. So um, it, sometimes it gets a little bit difficult to try to get them. What we try to do is when we get ready to do a tour, we try to get them in a week or two, and then we work on stuff, and then we go on the road. And, uh, you know, that's, the re that's how we're trying to get it done now, rather than go in the studio and spend days and days and days and days and money, money, money. And some days you have something, some days you don't. So we're just trying to rhythm it out to where we can make this happen. Hopefully this is in, in 23, we'll have something new. Can't wait. <laughs> what, why do you think uh, Europe embraced the band so much? Europe? Well, you know, Europe has a real good dark side, I think. You know, they like things that are odd. And MF was odd. Uh Bringing the funk and the rock and the funk together is something they never, you know, they, they knew what funk was. They heard the name, but they didn't really know how it worked. And then, of course, they were natural towards the rock thing with the rock guitars and whatever. And then Mother Finest comes along and we put those two things together. All of a sudden, the sun came out. They understood what it was. This one guy said, I never understood it until you guys played it the way you play it. They say you'd bring the rock and the funk and the sexy and the soul. You know, you bring it all at once. You know, and, it, and it is uh, quite happy. Yeah, it's really happy. It's good stuff. <laughs> you know, I'd like to ask guests on the show, Joyce, um, to name like their five Desert Island albums. But I'm thinking in talking to you, maybe better just ask you if you could just share with us uh, maybe like your five favorite other artists. My favorite other artist. Not fair. That's not a fair question, Scott. Your biggest influences are favorites. Yeah, well, you know, my biggest influences are not groups. They're really like Aretha, uh, Natalie Cole, I liked. I liked uh, Joplin, Janis Joplin. Um, and I like Tina Turner, is one of my favorites. Uh, that's about it. And, of course, I love Chaka because, you know, they don't get better than Chaka Khan. So those are my favorites. But 
that list is it for me. I, outside of that, I got nothing. Yeah, well, that's a great list for sure. Did Did you ever do a, a, a show with Shaka Khan, Rufus on the Bill? Yes. Yes, we toured in Europe together. It was awesome. Wow, I can only imagine. <laughs> did you guys ever yeah. get on stage together? No, but I was on stage with her daughter. I did a, a little tour called The Daughters of Soul, and Chaka's daughter was one of the singers there. Um, I didn't know her, and then she showed up one night, and they all got on stage together. All the high singers, all the high pitch singers, they were on stage together. So, no, not, in, not on stage with Chaka, not ever, no. Hmm. Well, how can uh, people best keep up with, I know you have the website. Why don't you tell everyone what that website is and how they can keep up with what you guys are doing? It's mothersfinest.com, like everybody else. You can get there. And then there's the Funk Metal Rock Soul Diva, which is mine. Um, you know, everything's there, whatever they want to know. The door swings both ways. Everybody can come. <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, all the goodies. Great. Come on. Is there, come on. Is there, any, Hit us up. is there any important mother's finest element we left out of this conversation? Not really. I'm, I'm glad your interview was really, really delicious because we didn't have to go all the way back to when I was born, you know, which you, <laughs> that's how some interviews are. I'm over that conversation. No, I had a great time. This was uh, very intense. I liked it a lot. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Joyce. And I can't wait to see you guys play some more and uh, keep at it, you know, because we, we need it. You know, like you said, there's not enough uh, new new uh, blood out there doing this kind of thing. So keep it going. Yeah. All right. You got it. All right. Take good care. All right, baby. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkandstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkandstuff.net, and linking through funkandstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on keep vibing on to the rhythm of the one.